doing a job motivated by external rewards. Just like schoolwork is motivated by an external reward called grades, so it's a kind of training. I sense that in this program, you are unlearning that. And as Martin was saying, following an inner motivation, which is the desire to give, the desire to contribute something that's beautiful to you. And you could probably, most of you could probably go to a traditional business school and get a fancy degree. And perhaps it's harder and harder to do this, but perhaps get a high paying, high status job in a large organization with your MBA. But, and I'll generalize here a bit, maybe I'll overgeneralize, but the work you would be doing there isn't what sets your heart on fire. Maybe you do it because you're paid a lot and that would be tolerable for a while, but in the end you would feel as so many people in those organizations feel, you'd feel like I'm not living my life. I'm living the life I'm paid to live, but what about my life? So the people in this program have made a brave step to come to something that doesn't give you a fancy diploma, that doesn't give you a high status, it's not even accredited, but it is training for participation in a different story. And I could say more, but maybe I've talked too long already. <laughs> <laughs> you give me, you give me a chance to come back to that gift thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. we, you know, it's not out of the blue. We try to um, present this evening, and uh, we came up with the formula: you're a bridge builder. So that's the name we put forward uh, to your gift. That's how, what I sense through your books and talks. You somehow combine easily what seems to be far off and uh, distinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I, guess, I guess one thing I do is I take very radical ideas and I present them in a way that people can accept them, mainly often like I'll preempt, I'll preempt, like I'll think, okay, if I'm that person, what am I gonna think? And I'll preempt that um, reaction. So for example, um, in my book, I speak of the story of interbeing. Interbeing is a word, as far as I know, coined by Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it means kind of interdependency, interconnection, but even more than that, interexistence. It means, so in contrast to a, a separate Cartesian self in a world of other, who sits there manipulating and competing, it's understanding that who you are is a reflection of the world, that everything that happens in the world is happening somehow in you. That anything that happens in one place is in some way happening everywhere, like, like in a holograph or a fractal. That any person in your life, any difficult relationship mirrors something in yourself. These are all ways to describe a story of interbeing. And I say it's a story because it gives us answers to who am I, why are we here, what's the purpose of life. Um, what's important, what's real, what's possible. Many of you may have ambitions that are impossible in an old story where things only happen when you exert a force. If you have enough money, then you can make it happen. But what if you start with no money? Well, sometimes you see people who can make amazing things happen and they don't have military force or financial force or media force. So anyway, so yeah, in my book, then uh, I, I lay out these principles, and then I, then I say, wow, that really sounds like a bunch of new age hooey, you know? <laughs> Interbeing, what I do to the other, I do to myself, all that spiritual bullshit. I said, so I said, I, I, I said that, I said, boy, does this sound like a lot of new age hooey to you? And then I say, I only used that term to convince you that I'm not a soft thinker. I'm not a dupe of any such thing. And if I dismiss new age people as being fuzzy headed and impractical, then I'm showing you that I'm practical. 
But that's an old pattern too, of beat up the weak person, or in school, make fun of the weird kid. So, because I'm a weird kid too, but if I make fun of the really weird kid, then I get to fit in. <laughs> so that's that's um, that's one way that I I, I don't know. Geez, I, I feel like I'm just. <laughs> I mean, really, to be a bridge builder, really, it's to put yourself in another person's shoes. That's all there is to it. You know, what's it like to be you? And that requires unlearning habits of judgment, which basically says, you know, if you do a thing I disapprove of, do you know why? It's because you're an asshole, that's why. If you're a corporate executive launching a new fracking project, it's because you're morally deficient you're greedy you're corrupt you're ignorant that's why it's because you're different than me when you do that there's no understanding possible but when you say okay what are the circumstances that give rise to that behavior what's it like to be the fracking executive what's it like to be the dictator what's it like to be the policeman behind the riot shield behind the tear gas what's it like to be the soldier what story are they living in in which everything they do is justified and right? Because if you can understand that story, then, you can, then you're in reality. Saying you're doing it because you're an asshole. That's not reality. Reality is, oh, you're doing it because you live in this story. You live in these circumstances. If you're in reality, then you have the possibility of effective action. So that's, I guess if I, you didn't really ask me, but... No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> but I think to be a, uh, that's the essence to be a bridge builder is what is it like to be you? Would you agree me terming this or come up with the term that's an inner discipline? I mean, the, the first reaction would always be asshole. And you somehow let that go or you breathe with it or whatever. Thanks. Um, Well, I think it comes down to self-love. Because why does it feel good to disparage and judge somebody else? Because it makes you worthy and valuable and good in comparison. Right? Like, I'm better than you. But why do we need to do that? Why does that feel good to make someone else wrong or bad? It's because of this self-rejection, <coughs> the belief I'm bad. And that is, sorry to say, but even taught in our, in our religious institutions and taught in the schools too, where you're taught that you can't just do what you want. And your natural desire maybe to play outside, that's what a bad kid does. A good kid does his homework. So goodness comes through self-control and conquering your natural impulses. That conquest of self mirrors the conquest of nature. It's all part of the same thing. So for me, you know, as I began to learn more self-love, it didn't feel so good anymore to be in judgment. The question then, of course, is how do you learn self-love? <laughs> and we are trained to make everything into your new success strategy that you have to try hard to do. Okay, I'm gonna try to love myself. But really, the way I learned it is by people loving me so much that it taught me to love myself. So maybe you cannot learn self-love on your own, but maybe you can help other people learn it by loving them. Just a thought. <laughs> weird that we've gotten here already. This is like a business school, right? <laughs> But it's totally relevant, you know, because if business, in the old story, business is about extracting as much as possible. Seeing everybody as a competitor, essentially. Economics says that right out loud. It says all human beings are motivated by rational self-interest. Everyone's trying to get the best deal. And you have 
uh, a confluence of interests, and then you do a deal. I remember the uh, president of General Motors back in the 70s. He said, General Motors is not in the business of making cars. We're in the business of making money. And that's essentially what is taught in economics, the theory of the firm. That's how business behavior is described and theorized. But I think we are transitioning <clears throat> in many ways from a world of extraction to a world of circular flow, where not just in business, I mean in agriculture too, it's no longer how much can we extract from the land, but the, um, permaculture movement, for example, it's about how do you build the soil? How do you give to the land? Knowing that if I do that, then I will receive abundantly as well. So social enterprise is the same way. It doesn't start with how can I make the most money? It starts with what's the need here that I can serve? And money becomes a way to enable you to continue meeting that need and to, to grow in your service. But it's not the goal. It's just part of a circular flow uh, where giving and receiving end up in balance, just like in nature. Well, let's suppose um, you found your gift. And uh, as, as I've heard you saying, uh, it has been a quite a way for you too, personally. Um, then in, in a school like this, you try to test how you can serve uh, to the society, bring that gift forward and do something with it. In the old story, as you coined it, the term, uh, it would mean you look at the profit you can make with that. What would it mean in the new story? What's the, the measure of uh, that it works or it's applicable? It makes sense, the gift is fulfilled and received. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could develop metrics, you know, depending on what your enterprise is. If you're teaching impoverished children to fix bicycles and make a bicycle repair shop, then you could measure the number of children who learn that skill, the number of bicycles, et cetera, et cetera. You can measure things. But I think part of the transition that we're in is actually finding other ways besides metrics to guide our choices in life. That comes in the heart. That's mentioned in one of your books entitled The More Beautiful World mm -hmm. Our Heart Knows is Possible. Yeah. Which is a riddle, the koan <laughs> for me. Yeah. I love repeating the title. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> um, now the heart as a um, where does it have its place in business? Yeah. In your vision. Yeah, the heart is an organ of perception. Even in the body, it's an organ of perception. The heart is actually not a pump. That was one of Rudolf Steiner's key teachings. In fact, I was told that he said two things on his deathbed. The two things he thought were the most important to say as he left. One was, don't work for money. And the other was, the heart is not a pump. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the heart if it's not a pump? Well, on one level, it's a hydraulic ram that catches the blood and passes it as it goes. The blood accelerates as it reaches the heart. And then it gets passed on. And as it does so, it listens to, listens to the blood, which reaches every point in the body. So it's listening to the whole body. And based on that, giving more or less blood, um, alerting other endocrine organs to put more or less of some hormone. Um, so in the body, the heart is a listening organ. And it's also an organ of perception outside the body that that guides us to what um, 
guides us toward what's loving and what's beautiful and where to give. You know, sometimes it can be very irrational. The mind says, well, if I want to maximize my impact on the world, I'd better do a product, project that goes viral or that could scale up. That makes it more valuable if it scales up, right? But if it's some little project that will never scale up, well, that's not worth doing. But what if that little project that you think has no possibility of scaling up, what if that's what calls to your heart? You can feel, you can feel it. It, 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 it brings you feelings of love and connection and the desire to be generous and, and you're in flow when you do that. So you say, okay, I'll do that project. That's listening to the heart. And then very often something magical happens. Even though you have no idea how that could have a big impact, it does somehow. Someone finds out about it by accident, tells somebody else, and it grows in a way that's outside of your control that you couldn't make happen with any amount of money. <clears throat> but it happens around you. That's the kind of expanded creativity, expanded creative power that's available by letting go of the story of force, the story of a, a dead, inanimate universe composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons bouncing around according to impersonal mathematical forces, indifferent to human well-being with no intelligence outside of ourselves. That's the story of force. And when we begin to trust that there is intelligence in all things, then we can trust, yeah, I'll just do what is called to me and the results will be beyond what I can contrive. I feel like I'm speaking really slowly because I've been warned that people's native language isn't English. It's not because I think you're stupid, okay? <laughs> may try to <coughs> foster and see what happens. No, yeah. right. um, the other day I heard you talking about failure and almost being in praise of breakdowns. Mm -hmm. I think that's an inevitable topic in here. People try their best and they start uh, new experiments, projects, and they will fail from time to time. What's to be learned by failure? Almost all people are ashamed about it and try to avoid it. Yeah, what's that saying? Uh, it's when you stumble and fall that you find the treasure on the ground. Yeah. Um, there, there are no... Okay. If you want success in the world according to traditional definitions of success, there's a map for how to do that. There's a set of instructions how to get there. You study hard, you know, you build your resume, you do certain things and you do them well, and you'll get maybe success. But the kinds of things that many of us want to do today, there's no map for how to get there. There's no ready-made place in society that, that will reward our formulaic mm -hmm. efforts. It's an unknown territory we're wandering in. Part of exploring an unknown territory is getting lost, taking the wrong path. And, oh, you know, that path took me to a swamp. That path took me to a dead end. I have to turn around. But maybe next time then you recognize the signs of the wrong path. And then you share your experience with others who are also walking this new territory and, and pursuing the same goals and mission that you are. Maybe it might seem very different. I, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to any of you in this program. I don't know really even what kinds of projects you're interested in. But do you ever have, I see someone, um, Matt, Matt told me one about, uh, there was one in a vegan supermarket. There's hmm. one, a few, I've heard a few maybe. And I can imagine them. I'm familiar with social enterprise. And do you ever get the feeling, even though what you're doing is completely different from what she's doing, the feeling we're working on the same thing, different aspects of the same thing. We're allies. We are 
comrades in a way. And most of the things that you're working on, again, there's no recipe, there's no instruction set. Very often there's no ready validation from society or from the economic system. There's no guarantees. This is what it's like to wander in new territory. And it's threatening to people who are highly invested in the old story. And their voices will tell you that you are irresponsible, impractical, unrealistic, and naive. And maybe you have an inner voice that echoes that and doubts, doubts what your heart is guiding you to do. Which is why it's important to have gatherings and programs where you can remind each other that you're not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my, my job on this planet. <laughs> or we're, maybe we're all crazy together. Yeah. Right? <laughs> what makes it, to my understanding, even more crazy is that we live in a world that's on the brink of disaster, collapsing. And you've been talking right, about right. that too. So there is good sense that things should be <laughs> and ought to collapse. And more good sense that these new projects, these good-minded people should be successful. And there is even more stress on these entrepreneurs to make it better and to build a new world, mm -hmm. to enter the new story, whereas all the rest collapses. <laughs> That's quite a tension. Yeah. It's pretty obvious that sooner or later the whole thing is going to collapse, right? Unless you believe that infinite growth is possible on a finite planet. <laughs> it's going to collapse. Our financial system depends on growth. It doesn't work if there's no growth. Lending stops when there are no positive returns on investment or not enough positive returns on investment to justify lending. So if you're going to school to prepare for a high position <laughs> in that pyramid, you're preparing for a high position on a you know, collapsing structure. What you're doing in this, this program is actually the opposite of unrealistic and impractical. They're not paying me to say that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just stuck. But I do believe it. And I don't know, like, I don't, don't want to idealize the program or, you know, there, every, every program that I've ever seen, every institution, there are elements of the story of separation of the old structures built into it too. You know, we're all experimenting. No one knows how to do this. I like the experiments though. I like it when anyone tries something that's radically new. Even if, because, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's a dead end, at least we learned that it's a dead end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said it took you 30 years to change from one story, the old one, to the new story. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. No, I haven't, sure, I mean, I don't pretend to be living entirely in the new story either. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, even, I want to say, like, even the words old story and new story, that's a story, yeah. too. You know, it's a useful lens. It illuminates some things, but it obscures other things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find it useful. But, but like, nobody that I have ever met is entirely in full, total trust in the, in the interconnectedness and intelligence of all things. Um, we all, most of us have our, have our shadows. We have our, our unconscious programming from growing up in this civilization. If you, I mean, unless you are, you know, you grew up in a uncontacted indigenous tribe, you've probably been programmed by civilization in one way or another. Maybe some of you, some, some of you African people a little bit less because the programs of civilization haven't reached that far or that completely yet, and you still have some connection to another way of seeing the world. What I call the new story, but it's actually an ancient story. Mm. Maybe you still have perceptions and experiences that um, validate the intelligence of non-human beings, the intelligence of 
lakes, mountains, not just animals and plants, but all beings, the sun. Is the sun alive? Today, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, you know, in, in um, scientific thinking, the sun is not alive. It's simply a ball of fusing hydrogen. But it's not alive. Pretty much every human being who's ever lived up until the year 1700 believed that the sun was alive, that it has consciousness, that it has emotions of some kind. And then the scientist comes, the modern person comes and says, that's just an anthropomorphic projection, <laughs> which means projecting human qualities onto a thing. It's not alive. Child, a child might think so, but, but when we grow up, we know better than that. We know that it's just a thing. So you natives, you indigenous people, you're like children. Let us show you how to think. This is the same imperialistic mindset, the same colonial mindset that says, let us show you how to live. Let us... Your, your ways of life are wrong. They're primitive. They're backward. You should build roads. You should have factories. You should have schools. You should be like us. That's called development. Because we're developed, and you're developing. Therefore, your destination is to be like us. So it applies not only to economics, but also to, to epistemology, to ways of knowing. We know better than you. The dominant culture of this planet believed that so completely just a generation ago. It was unquestionable that our way was the best way. Because look at the magnificent glory that we've created. Look at this edifice of civilization, the miracles of technology. Life is getting better and better. And someday we're going to be the lords and masters of nature. We're going to um, with genetic engineering or nanotechnology or atomic power or whatever it was. I mean, the, the final solution changes over time. First it was, you know, the steam engine and then but <laughs> electricity and nuclear power, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's nanotech or something like that. And just this one, one final invention will make us, will allow, allow us to engineer perfect, a perfect world, perfect lives not just with material technology, but